All right, uh, welcome to another edition of Future View Fireside Chat. And I'm here today with uh, Brad Schomber, the current CFO of Spoonflower. And uh, um, Brad, thanks for, thanks for taking the time to join us. Absolutely. Um, let's just jump right, jump right in. You've had kind of a what, a, what a run you've had. You were channel advisor, IPO, and then Max Point IPO. And now here you are at Spoonflower. You guys have just been through a successful uh, acquisition. Uh, how are you feeling? Tired. Great. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about the acquisition of Spoonflower mm -hmm. with Shutterfly. It's a great uh, coming together of two really creative companies, and so I'm really excited to see uh, where we can take it from here. When you think of the role of a CFO, and you think of sort of the C as part of a management team, and you've now worked with a lot of executive teams, and, and obviously when you have these kind of transactions and things, there's a lot of strategic conversations. What how do, you, how do you see the CFO role in driving those conversations? You know, I think of it as a problem-solving role, as a partnership, um, and really, right, you're in charge of trying to manage the wealth of the business, and there are always limited resources, and everybody wants more, and rightfully right. so. Right. There's a lot to achieve and a lot of exciting things that can happen with some more resources. Uh, and you need to, to then come together as a group, decide on the strategy, right? And mm -hmm. the CFO should certainly have, and finance should certainly have a significant say in that strategy, mm -hmm. and then figure out as a group with the CFO leading that charge as to mm -hmm. how your resources get allocated to achieve the strategy that you set forth. Kind of makes sense. and and. How do you find, like, with the different management team members? I mean, different people react to those kind of conversations differently. I, I know I've always had times where marketing people and salespeople would present, like, a whole different set of numbers to me, like they were running their own finance group. Do you ever yeah. experience those kind Absolutely. of? Absolutely. Uh, now, luckily, at Spoonflower, we have a, a great team. Uh, every member of management is bought in and aligned and so there are still difficult conversations mm -hmm. right for me to them or them to me or, or together right um but is getting to know the people i think is important mm -hmm. getting to know what's important to them and and how they what success looks like to them mm -hmm. and then a lot of times it's not whether you get them everything um that they want necessarily mm -hmm. it's knowing that you tried, knowing that there's a communication right. there that you're, you're trying to please everybody as much as possible, I think goes a long way. And yeah. they're not just looking out for whatever they feel is their best interest for their silo, mm -hmm. but for the good of the company, for the good of finance and to help. So I think there's an awareness, a communication, and a, um, a sharing of vision there that's important mm -hmm. for success. Makes, makes sense. How do you, how do you, when you come in, how do you engender that? Like when you come into the organization and you sit down and you've got this management team, what is it? What, what's, yeah. your, what's your playbook on this? You know, I do think it is meeting with each of the team mm -hmm. members and going through I I exactly of what does your team do? What are you measured on? What's important to you? Why do you enjoy working here? Right. Right. right, right. A lot of the, the metrics and the numbers are important. Um, yeah. But it's that inner drive and that inner satisfaction that's of the utmost importance it's to that person. Yeah. And so ensuring yeah. that you're able to um, work with them in that context, I think, yeah. is key. And so Emp empathy, something and, that, that's, that's the yeah. word, right? Uh, you've, always, you, you've always been a very empathetic yeah. person, which yeah. is a great quality. I've, I, yeah, I can, it, it's when you deal with people who are in business, a lot of people are naturally problem solvers. and. And you want to go right to the solution, but you're right. You got to you got to kind of understand. Right. My wife always says sympathy, not solutions. You know, yeah. first, and then. And I definitely um, want to <laughs> solve yeah, problems, yeah, right? But yeah. it, at the end of the day, I find almost everybody else does too. They just go about it in different ways, yeah. right? And yeah. so it's it's that matching of how do we? All right, there, there's this problem in front of us. How's the best way to get through it? Yeah, it makes um, sense. I'm a big brainstormer. So I love to get, yeah, yeah. get in a room and, and throw ideas up on a, a whiteboard. And, and uh, number one, nobody has all the right ideas. Yeah. And a brainstorming session, I think, enables everybody to have the chance to participate as well as comes up with some really good 
you know, maybe the ideas that wouldn't be accepted, you know, in some other format. Right. So. One of the huge role things that you have to do as a, as a CFO, especially coming in, is deal with investors and boards. And what have you learned about, you know, and what are your, what are your kind of, what are your kind of thoughts about how to be effective in dealing with a board? I, I, it's a lot of, it's a hard thing. Can it be. is. And very similar to getting to know the management team, you need to get to know the board, right. the reasons that they're there. Um, some people are there just because they're experts in their field and want to lend their ideas and strategies. Some are, you know, the true owners of the company, right? And they right. care only about the dollar or somewhere in between, right? And so, um, and some people intake information through numbers and some people do through stories, right? Yeah, and yeah. you need to gain an understanding of how the board members want to be treated, how they ingest, how they communicate. Uh, to best uh, try and meet where they're trying to go with the company. Yeah. But it really is down to all about communication and finding that right level of frequency and, and style of information. Okay. So when you, uh, when you go into a, a new company and, and you've done that and you obviously, when they hire someone like you, they've got big ambitions. What are your, what are your first two or three things? What are the things you, you say, yeah. hey, I gotta get this stuff in place first, or how do you, you know, think about it, it? It's hard coming into a new position, right? Because there's the details of finance that I want to make sure that all of that's correct and that I understand it. And there's the strategy piece of it uh, and getting to know people. So I think the, the first thing is getting to know the management team, yeah. getting to know the board, yeah. right? Um, understanding each of the roles they play and who they are. Um, while then on the finance team, getting to know your team, and what are the problem areas? What are the risks? What are the things that if I don't look at this in the first 60 days could blow up on yeah, me, yeah. right? And I'll throw not just accounting in there, but insurance too, right? <laughs> I, insurance I hate insurance, with that's the hardest thing. Cybersecurity, um, D&O, and, yep. and those things that could really catch you if something goes wrong. All right, and I'll add a third, legal, right? There's mm -hmm. not always a general counsel in the businesses that I've been a part of. And so um, reviewing the status of where you are legally and are there potential IP issues, are there yeah. potential um, competitor issues or, or contract issues, um, definitely should be looked at pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I totally relate to that. I've, I've been through one IPO that had that had a very hands-on attorney who was very familiar with things and one where it wasn't so much. And I learned more about the law during that second one, things that I didn't even know you had to do. It's so complicated. Yep. Insurance yep. is another one. You always were good at that. I, yeah. I find that to be, it's a, it's a whole mental shift that you yeah, have to do. Yeah, you know, with. The, the thing that I've learned because mm -hmm. insurance is tough and I don't naturally enjoy it, but it's in those areas where you need to find a great third-party provider mm -hmm. that can do some of that heavy lifting in those areas that you don't enjoy and aren't mm -hmm. don't come as naturally, right? So I've been very fortunate that I've, I've found two or three great brokers to mm -hmm. work with so that I get comfort to know, but I don't have to spend an inordinate, uh, inordinate amount of time um, sifting through, right. you know, all the insurance contracts. And same, you know, I, my second IPO was without a general counsel. And again, right, yeah. you learn a ton. <laughs> perhaps more than you've ever wanted to. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you need to supplement that with an ex a third party expert in the field. Absolutely, right, absolutely, help, help absolutely. T talk to me a little bit about um, how you think about when you're looking at your accounting organization, the accounting piece, and, and I know you have a, a, a great background in, in the accounting field, you know, before coming on as CFO, um, and, and then and the FP&A piece. How do you yeah. balance the two? How do you think about them? How much time do you tend to spend in each? What's the? I like to spend more time on FP&A because it's an area that naturally interests me. Mm -hmm. I like being more of a part of the business. I'm looking out to the future of what can this company become and how can we get there. Um, but accounting are table stakes. You yeah. have to get it right. Okay. And so you need to spend enough time there to ensure that everything's being tracked correctly, uh, everything's being recorded and then reported out appropriately. So I'd like to spend a good amount of time in accounting to just to make sure all that's set up. 
once you have the right team there, and I'm very fortunate to have a great accounting team, mm -hmm. we're thin. We definitely need more help, but the people there are the right people for the roles. They're excellent at what they do, and that gives me the comfort then to we've hired an FP&A person in the past six to eight months. We're going to start expanding that now, and so mm -hmm. it allows me to free up to focus on that FP&A role. Makes, makes sense, yeah. Yeah, if the accounting doesn't work, it's uh, the FP&A is very hard right. for FP&A. It's a, it's a pyramid, right? Right. Um, you often use what's happened historically to forecast the future, help forecast the future right. in FP&A, right. and if your historical numbers are inaccurate, then you're not going to be able to forecast yeah, I've seen I know we've both seen that happen a few yeah. times in the in the past. And it's okay. hard enough to forecast appropriately when your historical numbers are accurate, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Have you ever had that when uh, when you look at a CFO job and the CEO pitches you on the tells you the numbers and uh, and you realize the business he's presenting to you is a complete numerical fiction. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, almost every model is a hockey stick up and to the right. Absolutely. <laughs> and I've built those myself. So <laughs> Um, what else would you tell we, we you know when you're talking to someone who's um, looking to get into a CFO role maybe moving from a controller to yep. a CFO or taking on a new CFO role what, what advice would you would you provide them it's going to seem like a plug but I mean it systems are mm -hmm. hugely important right mm -hmm. uh, automating getting out of Excel hell not doing the same thing manually over and over mm -hmm. in whether it's a senior accountant or controller or a VP or CF, right? Like w no matter what role it is or level, automating as much as possible mm -hmm. frees everybody up to do more. And especially at the management and above levels, controller on up, it frees everybody to be more strategic and that can only help the business. Okay. So I would think ensuring that you have systems in place as many places as you can will might be a little bit more difficult early on in implementation but will ease your life greatly moving yeah. forward yeah when you think about excel um sometimes it's easy to get something done one time with excel or it's, you know we're always trying to get to that next analysis mm -hmm. and if you do it once great but if you don't figure out, you're almost certainly going to need something more than once, and, right. and it's nice to automate it and make it, you know, move on to the next thing as opposed to redoing. Every month becomes Groundhog Day, kind of right? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. And and businesses change, mm -hmm. and so what happens a lot of times is you have that initial Excel template, and you wind up adding on different columns, and you add on different tabs, and you refer back and forth to different worksheets, and inevitably there's some error produced in that, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't flow as naturally as you'd expect it to. And a good bit of the time, those errors aren't captured mm -hmm. until very late in the game because everybody thinks, oh, I linked this appropriately. Um, whereas if you have an automated system that is designed to be flexible, that is designed to grow with you, right. then you don't have to worry about those, inher those errors kind of creeping up on you. Yeah, makes sense. Oh, one more, one more question I want to ask you. I'm just, uh, it's just, I'm actually interested. You hear a lot of when I when I've see people looking for CFO roles and things. There's a lot of uh, people tend to focus on like speed of close, like how fast do you close, and they they make that a litmus test. And yeah. I've always kind of felt like that was sort of misguided. I felt like quality of close is much more important and regularity of close, like. It's not so important to me that you close, especially if you're doing forecasting and living off the forecast, you know, whether I close in five days, business days, or seven business days is not so consequential as that I know I can count on. Right. I, I, I'd be curious to hear your Yeah, there, your there's, to me, there's a balance, and, you know, my team right now is, is thin, so we don't mm -hmm. close especially quickly, um, but we are making sure that we're getting it right, and... Um, making sure that we're not working our people too yeah. much so that they yeah. leave, right? Our people are really important. Yeah. They're yeah. there for, for a reason because they're doing a good job. You don't want to work them so hard over a three-month period that, yeah, you closed in five days, but now they're yeah. leaving. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a happy medium. The key is what is the information that is needed by the business to properly drive yeah. the business and make yeah. decisions? And so trying to then find that right balance from there.
Yeah, it's funny, if you get the forecasting process right, a lot of times the close is sort of a sort of inconsequential. It's just, okay, fine, we're closed right. now. We're already thinking about what the next month right. looks like by the time right. you get there. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, well, I, I really appreciate the, you taking the time, Brad, to, yeah, uh, to speak That's with great. us. And this is another uh, uh, version of Future View Fireside Chat, and look forward to uh, more in the future.